So, Joseph, can we go back a little bit? We'll get we'll come back to to Topsham and what you're doing at the moment. Uh, sure. le- a bit later on, but if, if you can stay till twelve, we can sort of go go back a bit because you you just explain. You live in Berlin, but you're obviously from the states. Yes. So how how did that all come about? Well, I guess back in the nineties, I'm I, you know I'm, I'm mostly from Philly as a, in a career, and I moved there when I was I lived there when I was a child, and I left and I lived in L.A., Boston, Louisiana. My mother's from Louisiana, so I spent a lot of time around the country traveling, always traveling, and settled in Philadelphia, and then through my career, I ended up making a record and making another record and just recording and writing songs and got a record deal and a tour in Germany back in 96, 97. And then by the end of the tour, the record company said, yeah, we'll put out your new record and the 5 a.m. record. And so they put that record out and started a career in Europe mainly. Um, So I was touring quite a bit over here and, you know, you're on the road and we meet people every day in different cities and I walked in a place and I met a woman and she was doing backflips in front of the stage in a wetsuit and she was beautiful and I, you know, the the whole band, is eyes and their whole bodies are turning, you know, she's (laughs) flipping by and that's my wife. (laughs) So I ended up marrying her because she's so cool and fun and great and, you know, I fell in love with her and so on and vice versa and she's East German coming from East, this is in East Germany and she grew up learning Russian you know that whole thing and so she didn't speak any English when I met her and I didn't speak much German at the time and um, we figured it out and so that's how I ended up staying there and we, have a, we have a couple kids and yeah well we'll get back to that but let's go go a bit, bit further but so when you when you're traveling around the States what sort of music have you heard in the previous years well, I spent um, in the early 80s a bunch... I mean, I'm a little bit older than I might look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm 52, so I was in the... I, was, I, I did, like, six years in L.A. in the early 80s. And, I mean, I went there knowing nothing, and of course, being nothing, and being just a child, early 17, 18 years old. And I got there at the time... You know, Michael. I remember working. I was got a temp job at Warner Brothers on Sunset Boulevard when Michael Jackson's Thriller was coming out, and this is I guess eighty three, eighty two, and this is the kind of stuff that I heard at that time. There was no folk scene really. There was no like acoustic music happening. It was a really strange period of music, and I was an outcast for sure. I was going to open mics and <laughs> learning how to write songs and learning to play, whether it's you know whatever kind of music and and then I did take a couple trips to Europe as a matter of fact I, my first time was to to England was in London in 80 I guess that would have been 84 singing in the tubes you know and getting pushed on by the cops and <laughs> you know and then I went to Paris and got pushed around by the cops there because I was singing every, you know and the hotels kicking me out all the time and learning how to perform that's how I really learned how to perform was a lot of on the street stuff and but so when you say folk scene, what what do you what do you mean there? Well, to me, folk singing is really just someone with a guitar or a piano or whatever the instrument is singing songs that are not so embellished and typically just honest stories and not not trying to sing about dragons, but really just singing songs about life or I don't know and and it, and. and it it became different, I think, in the '90s because of the whole new folk revival stuff, and as like f- new folk came along, and <laughs> you know. But I, you know, like I'm a, I'm I'm a songwriter. I write songs. I play guitar. I happen to play guitar. I play an acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and I sing. So I can I put a rock band a rock band behind me, and I'm a, I'm a rocker. If I play just an acoustic guitar, I'm in a I'm a folky a bit. I'm not a big storyteller, but my songs are stories, you know, so there's, there's, as I get music in every art, it's so, there's so many ways to look at it, and every, everybody's so different and unique, it's wonderful that way. Yeah, Answer so... Answer your question at all? <laughs> well, a little bit, yeah, a little bit, yeah, yeah, J, J, JD, but J, you feel free to... to join in with this because my, my, my colleague JT does an 80s show which mm. is mostly I would say uh, 80s 80s and <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's sort of going it's going always dance music if I can, doesn't d- look 80s it's uh, dance music mix remix okay. and I just voice over 
Yeah, I've got that down to a T now. Nice. <laughs> so, um, you just ma- ma- send me a mix and I'll talk over it. Literally. So he tends to think the 80s is an advance on the 70s. This is his, his general point of view. But... I would say the seventies, like the, the sort of singer songwriters, the seventies, the they were sort of faded out by by a lot of the things that happened in the eighties. Is that, and you, you you sort of came along at that that sort of point is when you were listening to different music going on. Is that? I mean, of course, I grew up on the on the songwriters of, of you know singer songwriters of the sixties and seventies, the Jackson Brown, Cat Stevens, and that sort. But then graduated to the Jethro Tulls and Leonard Skinner. I mean, talking about spectrum differences. <laughs> stuff but uh, yeah it, I mean it all phased out it just it just morphed everything's morphing all the time and every year it morphs a little bit more and it becomes this that and it just changes as life does nothing's going to last forever and you know but I yeah it's the it's the 80s thing was a for me it was a bit of a hole in the music it was like almost ten, it's like eight years six years of I, I, did, I couldn't relate to it myself so I'm just sitting in my, in my little bungalow in L.A. writing songs, <laughs> waiting for the next train to catch that'll actually be part of my world. You know? <laughs> Some starlet's house. So how did you get into into being with a band then? To, to, uh, was, that, was that soon, or did you just come around to that later? Um, I remember having a band at college briefly, and then when I moved to Philly... I was. I'm always. I'm always putting together projects, and I always was very young. Um, I put together a bunch of projects that were other songwriters. But well, I guess we need a bass player and a drummer if we really want to make this song sound bigger and more, you know, more alive. And it was just through virtue of needing the songs to be delivered and need the songs to become alive. It's always been music driven, um, in, in most of these cases. And so the bands were easy to find and, and in Philly it's such a great music scene um, m- millions of players and then we just, just latch on to I've, I've got a real penchant for finding drummers and bass players who work together who are basically like brothers because the rhythm section is the one thing it's, it's nearly uh, if, unless they really are tight together it's not cohesive um, a, a drummer from this world and a bass player from that world it rarely can you know unless they're they, they, it's just this thing so I'm, I'm really always looking for a section, and they're brothers. They just they do projects together. You know, Sly, Robbie Sly, and Dunbar. You know, the whole you know find those rhythm sections, and there's something magical about it. So, and that's how even my band today with with Freddie on the bass and Sven on the drums, my my German rhythm section. These guys have worked together for a long time, and it's and we all become after the years. It's like second nature with the bands. It's like in all bands, you know, they just become, become a band of brothers and sisters. You know, so. It's, and Freddie is one of the guys is is coming to play with Joseph. And yeah, Freddie's arriving today, and then we'll come come a bit, come a bit closer to the, to the mic. Freddie's uh, arriving today to play with Joseph on the, this tour, so he's oh right. To well, look, yeah, yeah, look, this is worth, worth mentioning. This. So, so on the because t- I thought you were just going to be solo on the on. No, the, no, we, no, we decided that um, it'd be. It's always much. Well, it's different, but fun and great. And Freddie is a phenomenal bass player as well as a guitar player. So it's like, well, why don't you bring your guitar and we'll do these shows and sing together? And he's got a, he's got an amazing voice, and is a wonderful guy and a great traveler and you know all those elements of touring. And so yeah, Freddie's coming over. Freddie Lubitz. Oh wow, <laughs> that sounds sounds really good. And his English is really good, so <laughs> <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, look, I think JD, could we have a, tra- a? Have we got a track from the from the CD that Jazz has brought in? I have. Yes. Well, let's let's play. Which, which is it going to be? Uh, number one. You can number the, number one. So, seek the truth. So, yeah? so to, if you explain, <laughs> a nice light song. <laughs> that's, my, that's my feeling. Anyway, that's <laughs> well, seek, seek the truth is a, uh, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of desire for trying to find someone who will tell us the truth in the politics and the world and you know the the yearning for for you know let's let, let not everything be politics let things also be the truth so it's, it's sort of about that and it's also about love and everything else mm-hmm. 